We're here. We're live. Producer Christian, let us know how it sounds out there. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Overtime. We are so glad that you're joining us today. As we always kind of talk about, Overtime is our weekly dive into the weekend message, where we hope that you're challenged and encouraged. Uh, Christian is sitting right outside of the booth, making sure that we sound <laughs> good. A real plan that I wasn't going to twitch. I keep watching myself, and I'm like all oh, twitchy. It's like, what is wrong with him? Yeah. So here I am already twitching. I'm sorry. We're, we're glad that you're here. This is week 51. We're almost at a full year. So... Next week, we're going to celebrate by... Want to count on something in this world? Count on overtime. <laughs> okay. Or Jesus. Oh, yeah. But it, we'll get to that. Okay. So we're so glad that you're here. I don't even know what we have to, to talk about. A lot. Um, a lot. There's a couple different things that we always like to draw your attention to. Um, one I'll say is that this weekend, we have another service. Right now, we're doing it online, in person, via drive through but also in person, in our sanctuary. If you want to be a part of that inside, we ask that you would respond. RSVP, you can do that on clcfamily.church slash the signups page. Just let us know that you're coming for that. Also, this Sunday is another Eagles game oh, yeah. at 1 o'clock. Unless COVID kind of jacks with the series, like with all of the NFL this that, past week. Is that what happened to the Patriots? It did happen to the Patriots. And... I don't, I don't know why they only postponed one game or one day, but whatever. That That's not the reason why they lost. They just lost it. Yeah, I'm a good defensive line to coach is yeah, all it is. They just, they're they're offense stop, lost they're going to stop the Chiefs. Anyway. They, they don't have a coach who can make a defensive plan. Uh, but, I would disagree, but yeah. that's not what we're talking about here. Anyway, so we are glad that you're here. If you want to be a part of that Eagles game, as of right now, what we're planning is that all the 1 o'clock games through October – we will be showing here at the church. We'll be watching it on our, our large LED screen that's outside. So bring your bon, bonfire. or a, uh, We've talked about this before. Bring, bring, your fire pit to put something in. bring your fire pit if you're interested in doing that. Uh, bring any tailgate <laughs> options, anything that you want to do. Uh, we, we'd be love, love to have you be there for that. That's a lot of fun. Um, so that game starts at 1. Tailgating can start as early as 11 o'clock. We'll yep. have the game on or the pregame kind of at yep. 11 o'clock from there. Also, the last weekend of the fourth friday of this month which is on the 23rd october 23rd we will be doing another movie night in the parking lot I have yet to pick that movie i know that i should have probably already had that decided but if you have we'll, we'll if you have an out. idea send ben an email he likes sure. ben at clc family sure Church. send me an option I, i'm not opposed to any um opinion but we do want to keep it family friendly so make sure that it's not like rated r no, yeah no, no beavis and butthead yeah no none of that i couldn't i still as an adult my mom won't let me watch that anyway. so this week we started a brand new series called jesus for president we're still in the book of luke so we had done 11 weeks of the book of luke and we're still continuing that we'll be continuing that for the next year or how, longer. how long yeah Something yeah like year or longer um but with just kind of the focus as we talk about and we look about look at um, the political landscape that we're in right now with, you know, the, in the middle of a two presidential um, runnings, if you will. So in the middle of an election year, this is a complicated and interesting time. If you watched the debate last week, you know that it's a very interesting time. So uh, do you want to kind of give us a, a catch up or a rundown of what we talked about this weekend as we started this new series. Yeah, so I grew up um, in a fundamental Baptist church world, and there's so much I'm thankful for. My understanding of the Bible, scriptures, memorization of those scriptures, all that came from that world, right? And yeah. so really thankful for it. And yet uh, there were just areas that were just off limits, right? There, I didn't, yeah. didn't talk about science much, didn't ask the questions uh, about dinosaurs for sure because, you know, somebody would point to... It says there's a Leviathan and Job. There's this great woolly mammoth. See, that's the behemoth. There it is. That's what's there. See, that's the dinosaur. The end. Quit talking about it. Well, what do we do about carbon dating? The flood. The flood did it all. You know, like just these things yeah. that, you know, just real quick, quick answers. Don't ask any yeah. more questions about it. And what was off limits, but yeah. on limits, there was politics. Yeah, no, right. it was allowed, but there were very specific talking points, right? And so... What, that you're allowed to talk about, pro-life, allowed to talk about, you know, some of those things. Other things, definitely socialism, communism, bad, right? <laughs> pro-life, good. And uh, so there are just some lanes you could stay in. And lanes I agree with in, in many cases, like even socialism, disagree with. But, but it's because, and what I said at the very beginning of the message, is our country is sick, right? Yeah. So we, I know we're going to get back to that. Yeah. Um, but let me actually double down on that. It's not just our country is sick. The people in it are sick. Yeah. Now, you have some people in mind, and I'd go, before you really think of them, go look in the mirror, because that's actually who I'm talking about. 
Yeah. Right? You and I are sick, right? And so it just doesn't make sense because we're sick, because we're broken, our country's broken. And these uh, elephants in the room, we really just got to engage with and talk about. Like this idea that one candidate's the Christian candidate, one candidate's not the Christian candidate. And depending on your political leaning, you can make that, right. you can make that, you know, declaration is just so dangerous because our presidential candidates are sick. Right? Yeah. We all are. And so and all this stuff. So just so it makes sense that we would put on big boy pants and we would have the conversations we have to have in light of the Bible. And so I don't want us to be a church that sticks our head in the sand. I don't want us to be a church that tries to ignore what seems yeah. true, right? And uh, so what, what you know, we talked about today in the staff meeting, all truth belongs to God, right? So we shouldn't be afraid of truth. Truth is never the problem. Now, the way you present it, the way you receive it, that can be the problem. But truth is never the problem. So it makes sense that we chase after truth. And all truth matters to God. And all truth belongs to God because the scriptures tell us that truth is actually not an idea but a person. Truth is Jesus. So that's why I've been going through this Gospel of Luke series. He's going, what's the truth? Well, the truth is Jesus. So let's study him. So Gospel of Luke, biography about Jesus' life, like a biographical stat, a sketch that helps us know what truth is. And truth and certainty are found in a man. His name is Jesus who happened to be more than a man. He happened to be a God. And so the Gospel of Luke is written to basically a Probably a political advisor, leader, you know, official, and wrestling through the tension of living in a broken world, feeling the pressure to give allegiance to a broken man, Caesar's Lord is what he had to say, this guy named Theophilus, and instead transitioning to this place where we establish that Jesus is Lord. And so the Gospel of Luke just seems like, you know, yeah. perfect timing. That's why we talk about timely, timeless. It's time. Lee, it was written to Theophilus and the first century Christians so they could establish their hope and trust in a new kingdom and a new king, Jesus. Yeah. Right? And then also uh, timeless, meaning it's just as applicable right now in 2020 to our current condition and our sickness and our current circumstances, our political you know, uh, complications. And so this makes sense that we wrestle through it. So it's going to take us a while. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. It's going to frustrate you at times, but I certainly hope it's going to be helpful for you. We just want to set up the foundation at the very beginning. What I hope happens over these next five, four more weeks. We'll finish it up November 1st with the election being on November 3rd. Um, what I hope happens is I hope that you'll place your vote for a candidate. Right. But not place your hope in that candidate. Yeah. Right? And so That's we right. have this responsibility in this democratic republic that we live in that our voice matters. God gives us authority in that. So crazy. Throughout human history, that's very rare, so we get it. So we got to place our hope in a can- or place our vote in a candidate, but we should not place our hope in that candidate because all of our hope should be placed in, tethered to, you know, Jesus. And so yeah. we began that series by looking at some really unique individuals. You got John the Baptist, and there's a bunch of people wanting to place their hope in him, and then you have uh, some other people that show up. Uh, Herod the Tetrarch, or Herod Antipas, <laughs> uh, Herod the Great shows up. Herodias shows up. There's some people that I mean, this is like the that you know the you know the Shahs of Sunset Strip are uh, keeping up with the Kardashian Herod edition, or they're keeping up with the Herodians. There it is, boom. The keeping up with the Herodians. That's what it is. Like we all these people that people are paying attention to, loving and putting their hope in, and it was a broken, broken world. Yeah. But they start at least the people who have come to the conclusion that Herod was not their hope. Pontius Pilate was not their hope. Caesar was not their hope. So instead, they were looking for another place to place their hope. And what's interesting is this passage starts out with people who yeah. are kind of kicked and out, ostracized from regular government, regular you know, community. And Luke's going to highlight this guy, John the Baptist. And they're going to come and they're going to want to attach themselves to him, yeah. tether themselves to him as the one who is going to bring them hope. And he goes, hey, 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 this is what he starts with. I am not one. There is one mightier or greater than me. And so that's what stinks about this whole thing. I had this great idea. So I had Joe Biden, the character of him, and <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Donald Trump, his character. Hey, our country's sick. I'll talk about that. And then here's John the Baptist. Boy, is he crazy. He eats, you know, like uh, locusts, bugs, yeah. locusts or whatever out in the, in the middle of a field. And people are coming to attach themselves to him. Like, what an overcorrection from the political norms. This yeah, guy right. like, literally is homeless. Well, these guys are in it. Must be this guy. And he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa not me. And so... Literally, what he says is Jesus is greater than all these things, right? In fact, in John 3, he tells us that he must decrease and Jesus must increase. Actually, Jesus increases, others decrease. So I had this I had this imagination. You got John the Baptist and you got Joe Biden and President Trump. And I was going to have them all, our, our former Vice President uh, Joe Biden. I don't want you to think I gave one a title and not 
<laughs> didn't mean anything, man. So all three of them, I was going to slap on this big greater than sign yeah. and put up Jesus. So I grabbed Jesus, I'm putting up there, and I'm like, okay, this is the moment I want to say Jesus is greater than, and y'all are going to be wowed by the felt board and the alligator mouth open towards Jesus. And I couldn't find it anywhere. Yeah. So if you go back and watch it, you're probably looking, seeing me like looking down and doing all sorts of you know crazy parts of the Caribbean Johnny Depp moments, <laughs> which is... No. Which you might have just interpreted as normal behavior yes, for sir. him. But I was actually trying to find the alligator mouth. I couldn't find it anywhere. I'm like, oh my goodness, this whole sermon was all about that. Do I say it anyway? I can't say it now because because the greater than signs are there. So I have this great idea that Jesus is greater than. That's the big idea. Jesus is greater yeah. than John the Baptist. Jesus is greater than Donald Trump. Jesus yeah. is greater than Joe Biden. And he's greater than Ronald Reagan and John F. Kennedy. Yeah. Right? So he's greater than those things. And so let's put our hope there. And the reason we got to put our hope there is because our country's sick. Yeah. And so let's acknowledge the sickness. And let's actually have the awareness and the courage to call that out in ourselves and go, yeah. we have looked for a hope in something that cannot bring the hope we're looking for. Yeah. So we got to vote for a candidate, but we cannot hope put our hope in that candidate. Yeah, that's good. Hence this sermon series, and that's what kind of big idea. Jesus yeah. is greater and all those things. Yeah, I do think I saw that actually fall. Like I saw something fall at one point onto the to the stool. And mm-hmm. if you don't watch it, like you can listen to our sermons online, but you can also watch it as well. I, as I watched it again, like I couldn't see where it fell, but uh, while I was sitting in the sanctuary, you can I'm pretty sure that I saw it fall to the ground, but I was like, ah, I guess it wasn't important. No, it was very important. <laughs> Jesus is greater than all those things. I'll bring back that alligator mouth. The greater this than week. make yes, that point yes, this week. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I do want to kind of dive into kind of the whole idea of the series, because I feel like I grew up in uh, a similar tradition in the sense that yeah. we didn't really talk about politics. Like yeah. church and, and politics don't really blend and yeah. it's not really something you should get into. But, it, it, and maybe even it feels like the rules have changed from, I don't know, when I was a kid to now. It's like, how do you how do you not talk about it as a believer? Yeah. And what happens is that I think that... Plus we all have we all have a platform now. We all got yeah, social right, media. We right. want you to... T- you, you should know what we ate right. and how, what, you know, Pinterest idea we got that's yeah. now on our wall, right? We all, yeah. we all have a platform. So we're in the season where the platform's all political. Well, yeah. we have to comment, you have to offer some commentary and, to it. And it seems as if like, I guess what I would say almost as a disclaimer as we start this, yeah. like I think that you did a good job on Sunday, but just even as you're listening to this now, I think no matter what side you like lean to, or even if you're in, you're in the middle, I think you a can, centrist. A yeah. centrist. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think that you can hear things either through kind of your red hearing aid or your blue hearing. Yeah, not aid. even like, can you do. Yes, we do. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so. And what happens is that you can even become defensive of that of going. No, I think that what he meant was this. And so I think a few disclaimers was one. We're definitely telling you to vote. Like that is a responsibility as believers that you have. And we'll help you with it. Just yes. keep coming. And we'll help you with it. We'll give you some good lenses and matrices and, yeah. you know, filters to sort through yeah. how, how to participate in the election. Not going to tell you to vote for right Yeah. Now. Won't tell you who to vote for, but the point is to vote, but also that where do you place your hope? And that's yeah. really what you're talking about. I thought what you said was great. Um, you know, place your vote in the candidate, but don't place your hope in that candidate. Thanks. I think that was great. Like, I, I, do, I do think that that's well, accurate so, yeah. because I think that the president of the United States, whoever he or, or one well, day maybe be. she will be, yeah. like in this round, whoever he may be, is not my savior. Mm-hmm. Only Jesus is my savior. And he is the only one that I can truly look to. And that's the point of this series that I hope that all of you get, but we are going to talk through some of the politics, some of the things that will come up. But again, the whole focus is Jesus. Like, so even more, as you were just talking about the alligator, like Jesus is greater than Biden. Jesus is greater than Trump. And he's greater than all of the things Mm -hmm. that we experience in life that are good or bad. Yeah, and so uh, let me try in in there. One of the things I hope is this won't be just ethereal, just kind of this thing there. We're going to give you some practical steps, right? And so we're going to get to those at the very end because what we can do, what can help put our allegiance, our mind back into Jesus is talking to him. Right communicate with him and so one of the things that we're doing as a church and we'll talk about it more is that we we can right now you don't know any other steps don't know what i can't send you to whether or not you should li- read david french or you know uh elon musk's perspective or you know whoever else's perspective right yeah. uh, uh but what we can do is go we can pray and yeah. so you're going to keep hearing that and so a practical tool even as you hear this now i want you to hear it two or three times throughout this time together Practical tool you can do now. Disagree, agree, whatever that is, is we can be praying for our country yeah, for sure. and praying for the election. And I would argue, while you should place your vote in a candidate, you shouldn't place your hope in a candidate. The greatest thing you can do, 
this uh, election season is not actually vote. It's pray. Yeah. Right. And we see that happen with Jesus even in this moment of baptism. So what you hear up front, you have a role and responsibility. Voting's one of them. But the greatest role right now is to pray. Yeah. And I feel like even thinking through Romans 13, like the establishment of government, like yeah. I feel like that's our responsibility as believers. Like, And I'm even cautious. I feel like, and I'm very opinionated. Like, I, if How's that work out for you? Uh, not always great. That's why I'm not. <laughs> but uh, I feel like I've always got thoughts. And I, one of the things that I, I feel like I've tried to learn is that before I share any criticisms specifically of... You got to get on TikTok then. I think that's where you're supposed to share all those things. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't share with them. Well, well, now that TikTok's staying in yeah, the United States I now, that I, I don't know. But, uh, like, I think one of the things that I try and caution myself to do is go, before I'm critical of a public official, have I spent time praying for them? Yeah. Like, I think that that's a good kind of pause or a good kind of test to take to go, hey, yeah. my responsibility, if all authority is established by God, have I done my job to pray for them? So I think prayer is so critical, yeah. and I think we're going to kind of circle back to that. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that you had said was that this country is sick. And I, I really want to hear kind of like explain that because I think that that's one of those statements that you could hear and maybe be offended either from your blue or your red hearing aid and go, mm -hmm. what do you mean that's sick? Like for those that hopefully have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that probably doesn't require much explaining. But if you are listening to this and you're maybe a little bit confused, maybe you're still new to your faith, that could be something that you're going, wait, what are you, what are you saying? Can you explain that a little bit deeper? Oh, uh, yeah, and so, um, yeah, we'd be happy to. And it, it's worse than just our country sick. I mean, yeah. at, the, at the core, we also are sick. Yeah. But we see, it's just not, guys, like, this is where awareness matters so much. I literally was just saying at staff, like, it just seems like our presidential candidates don't have a lot of self-awareness, yeah. right? I mean, and you, you have an opinion on that, particularly on one or the other, right? You have the real opinion of the lack of awareness they have, and as I'm saying that, like all of a sudden, I just feel like this shiver run down me. Like, I'm saying this to a bunch of people, and they might actually be looking at me, going, "You know, who else doesn't have any awareness, Josh? You know, like this, this whole idea of like, we just we're just really unaware of how we're received, how we're experienced, like the talking over, the name calling. It's like these yeah. are the the greatest officials we have. Like these are the guys. These are the guys that are going to be one of the two of them is going to be the president of the United States one of America. Currently is yeah. And one could for be the next yeah. four years, and you see how they interact with each other, and you yeah. you definitely have an opinion which one you think interacted better or worse, and it's going to be based on your political leaning. It just right. is. Right. But regardless, you would look and go, there is something wrong. You know, you know, imagine that, and at the highest level, then watch all the trickling of that right. on social media. Right. And it is again. Hundreds and thousands and hundreds of millions of people who can't really see themselves either. Yeah. So we have a we have a nation who cannot look in the mirror because we're too busy taking the mirror yeah. and trying to help other people see it. No, you can't. No, you can't. I can't. You know, like this this battle of who's worse, whose people are worse, and we just right. see it. There's just so much anger and vitriol. Mm. And you can see it in your own marriages, right? You can see it in how you interact with your spouse, and your spouse interacts with you. There is just this blame game all the time. It's someone else's fault. Someone else's fault. And so we just have to acknowledge that there's something wrong, but that it's actually there and it's wrong, right? Yeah. And so what, I, what I'm so appreciative about this right now is it's just clarity. Like, yeah. it's just truth, right? Truth is never the problem. How you receive it, how you share it, maybe, but truth is never the problem. So we just have to look at our nation and go, you've said it. Is this the best we got? Yeah. Right? And it creates fear and worrying you. The yeah. best hope we have is a couple 70-year-olds. Yeah. Right? Nothing shot at the age, but like, Best hope we have is an entertainer or someone who's been in politics for yeah. more than four decades. That's it. Yeah. Like, you understand. Like, there's just this. And we go, there is something so bro broken that these are the folks we're putting our hope in. And it's just indicative of all the people in the world. And so yeah. they are just an archetype of us. Yeah, right. So we see right. all that. We see it all play out. And we go, why in the world do they keep blaming each other? No, yeah. it's your fault. It's your fault. And you go, oh, my gosh. Like, Open up the scriptures. In the very beginning, right. everything was good and perfect and lovely. And the minute they decided, Adam and Eve decided to walk in their own plan other than God's, which is exactly what all this is, to walk away from the scriptures, walk away from the truth, and try to take charge of their own lives, their own circumstances, their own future, all of a sudden, it wreaked havoc on their world where they finally got some awareness, but the awareness they got was that they were broken. Yeah. And they felt so much shame. They literally were hiding because they were naked. And what happens, God shows up and kind of shines the mirror on them and goes, where are you? Meaning, could we at some point just establish where we are? 
So that same question is so important for right now. I'm just going, can you just, for a second, with all the fear and trembling that comes with this, just pause for a second and go, where are you? Like, yeah. where are we? Where is our country? Yeah. How do we end up here? How can we have such different values and ideologies and see the other side as hateful and vindictive, mm-hmm. right? The vitriol on both sides of the mouth is considered hate speech to the other side. And right. Where are you? No, God says it's Adam and Eve in their sickness. And what you see happen is Adam goes, not me, she did it. I don't mean to point at you, like you're the yeah. she. I'm just going like, she did it, right? Yeah, and right. And Eve goes, not me, the, the serpent. serpent did it, right? Yeah, right? So there's just this, you just see this and go, at some point, guys, we just got to stop pointing the fingers and stop thinking the next person is going to do it. John, you're the guy. No, I'm not yeah. the guy. So if we're going to point a finger in any direction, we're going to point it in that which can actually make us whole and healed again. Yeah. And the only one is Jesus. So I don't say the sickness because I want you to feel shame. But I do say it because I want you to feel conviction. Yeah. I want you to see in the mirror, all of us. I want me to see in the mirror. I want my kids to see in the mirror and go, we cannot put our hope in that. Josh, yeah. you cannot put your hope in that. Not him, not her, not you. And so, that's what I love about this season is, boy, is it on display. Yeah. And the, the whole For world's sure. watching. And yeah. it's pretty embarrassing. So, yeah. can we just acknowledge that there is something wrong and we are sick, which is why I explain it the same way I explain the laws. Like, God gave us laws at their highest level to reveal that there was something wrong. It's like an MRI machine, right? There is a cancer in your body. And if you don't do something about it, if something doesn't change, it will lead to your de- demise and death. Yeah. So we look at our country and go, there's something wrong. And can we look to the one who could possibly fix it? So we are sick. We're sick. And when you are sick and you're beyond your capability of fixing yourself, you've got to go to one who can help you. Right. So got to go to the physician. And what kind of physician can fix a really broken world? Well, the one who made the world. Yeah. Right? right. And so, wow, I don't mean to get so right there. But like, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, it's just, that's the thing. And so please don't take offense to that. Please yeah. don't like, you know you know bow up just yeah, yeah. receive it and go maybe the, this is time to look for a healing yeah and if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves yeah and They're, crowd to me then maybe or then he would he'll maybe he would the scriptures say he would heal their land yeah there's a couple things in that like that statement can sound offensive right oh, like yeah, we, yeah, the, sure. we're we're sick but that's what like in my small group we're working through ephesians right now ephesians 2 verses 1 1 through 10 is really kind of the, the what we talked yeah. about and paul identifies that exact thing he goes you were 2 verse 1 says as for you you were dead in your transgressions and sins and he continues on like that's like that's pretty harsh like yeah. statement that's a definitive statement of going man yeah the, the bible really is and can be offensive because that's the reality that we have to face but i think that in facing that and looking inside there's a freedom in that because when you're always pointing to other people it feels like you know i'm a hypocrite like i'm well, not and you're really helpless like you're helpless you yes. can't do anything about it because it's someone else's fault yes. wow how in the world do we give the president of the united states that much power and control over our life yeah how in the world do we give joe biden that much power and control over our life right. that we're so helpless right. if they don't do what we need them to do right so, and so i think that there's yeah. something freeing in that and uh i, I will say too uh, as we started the service this week and you can even see and hear this uh-huh. online um, we had a fake debate like it was an edited oh, version yeah. oh, so of it was kind of, of cringy <laughs> like i was trying to speak to my generational z like. i thought it was great like so basically what what we had done is we edited uh i guess it was from the last uh presidential debate one was like, from the uh democratic national uh, debate in the primaries one was actually from hillary clinton and donald okay. trump that question actually came up in that debate okay so that was an actual so, question so the question it. was like can you name anything good about the other candidate uh-huh. and basically we edited together clips where they just were silent the entire time i think you put in like crickets, crickets in there babies baby crying, crying yeah. like i just thought it was fun i do want to let you know that that was not a real thing yeah just in case you were watching you're like wow I missed that. Or is it, did something <laughs> happen to the projector? Is it this guy or the screen? Yeah, yeah, right. So that was an a, a edited video that we put in there just in case you were curious. Um, I don't think either one of those guys could ever not talk, but that's mm. just from the last debate. But even that, that might be judgmental. Sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Um, so uh, I thought that that was good. But I, I think that for me, even coming back to, there's another point that you had made towards the end that I think Ephesians 2 might come back up. And maybe okay. that's just because I'm thinking through it. Yeah. Um, but towards the end. So 
as we look at that, I think understanding, you know, our country is sick. We as individuals are sick. Yeah. And there, I think that there is a freedom of, of going, you know what, the answer and the solution is not found within myself. It's found within someone else, and that someone is Jesus Christ. So, Yeah, so as we think about this, even the fits apart. So we just came from Luke chapter 3, 1 through 14. This is where uh, John Bevis quotes Isaiah, saying this is always in the plan, right? Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight yeah. paths for him, so everybody can see God's salvation. That's Jesus, right? And then after that, he kind of goes into this, you brood of vipers. Yeah. So right. like, you think it's offensive to go, you're sick, our country's sick. That's literally that 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 is kind of the setting and the mood of the environment because then finally people some people probably walk away and others go well what should we should we do yeah. then so john's going to offer some things to do and at the very end there he goes be content in all things right yeah. oh, okay how do i how do i live in this world and they're going the only way i can live in this world is if i put my hope in the right thing and then all of a sudden that's where you have that well maybe we should put our hope in john yeah right. and john goes oh no 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 he could tell in their hearts right did you see that all were questioning in their hearts concerning john yeah, whether he might be the christ so john answered them he goes hey, i know what you're thinking whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. I just called you brood of vipers. I told you yeah. to fix things. And all of a sudden, you're going to go, ooh, new guy to follow, right? <laughs> ooh, new guy. And so John goes, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. Let me make sure you understand this. Not me. Don't you follow me. You yeah. stay back. Don't you get close to me. Social distance, right? <laughs> stay away because I am not your hope because Jesus is greater. So you yeah. see that if that's the tension and the thing that you feel, then it's probably the right one, yeah. right? And right. I think one of the dangers is either the church skirts away from politics altogether right? right. Or the pastor kind of gives them an alternative of someone to follow. Yeah. Right? And on neither side is this going to work. We don't we don't ignore it and just tell you to play your political game. Also, we're not saying don't don't tether yourself to me or Ben yeah. or any of our staff because we want we certainly hope this whole series is going to point you to the one you can't put your hope in. That's Jesus. So. Yeah. And, and that's good. So as we get into verse 16, it says John answered them saying, "I baptize with water." But one who is mightier than I is coming, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. I thought that this, uh, and, and I feel like I've, it was John 14, where I think it's 14, unless I'm not remembering correctly, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And so I've done some study 13, on that. Right? But yeah, 13. So 14 is where he starts his last discourse. Yep. So could you, I, th I feel like it's worth repeating again, kind of the significance of what actually John the Baptist is saying here in that. Yeah, so uh, I'm most people had servants, a lot of religious leaders. And so if John, just in the beginning of John chapter 3, uh, just the preceding verses, is actually giving, he's responding to uh, individual people groups. Right. That Why would you respond unless there's individual people groups in there? So you got religious leaders. You have tax collectors, right? right. Um, in fact, I'd recommend a, a book, a movie called The Chosen that Dallas okay. Jenkins has just produced. Really good. You can go to vidangel.com and you can watch it. Beautiful, beautiful cinematography. But they did a really good job in the very first episode highlighting the tax collector, mm -hmm. like, and just like his <laughs> disgust on germs and the money and all that kind of stuff. And so it's a very dirty world, and thing animals were considered dirty. Yeah. Uh, Jews are really good at, at defining just about everything as unclean. Yeah. Right. And so they wouldn't have ever dealt with a lot of their own body because it was so dirty. And so these guys are all wealthy and have servants. And within that deal, like they were allowed to ask a lot of their servants, like, you know, clean every part of their body, do all those kind of things. Like yeah. they were like kind of treated as less than human, like yeah. two thirds of a person. But even in like that really broken, broken system, uh, there was just a, there was a line that they weren't allowed to cross. Like right. this is so dirty and so gross and so disgusting that we won't even allow Roman leaders, Caesars, to require this of their slaves. And that was touched their feet because yeah. it was so nasty. Take their sandals off. That was not part of their responsibility. Yeah. Everything else was they can wipe their bottoms, they can change their diapers, whatever else is, but they cannot touch the feet. That's yeah. the, the significance of this thing. And so when John, John is saying that, he's going, look, I'm not even allowed to do this, but even if I were allowed to do this, even though everybody else has said that's not even worthy that because it is so gross he's going that is so much more clean and so much more perfect mm. and so much more worthy and holy than anything about me that i could not even do that piece yeah. now understanding that when we get to john chapter 13 and jesus is pausing and preparing yeah the disciples for the coming revolution he's going to teach them how you actually make a revo revolution right yeah. you're going to he's going to teach people what to do he says that he came to serve not be served yeah. right and yeah. so when he is touching their feet this is so significant 
that he is literally doing this one thing that would never be required of the worst of the worst. And so in this moment, what you see is John the Baptist is going, this is gross and disgusting and I should not have to do this. And I am not required to do this. But even if I were to go, hey, can I do that? I would go, I can't because even that's cleaner than anything about me. So the dirtiest part of Jesus is infinitely more clean um, yeah. than the rest of the human world. Anything that's attached to Jesus is that much more clean than the rest of the world. Anything that's attached to Jesus. So if that's the case, how do you get clean? Sure seems like the way is to attach yourself to Jesus. Yeah. Right? So there's just a lot you see here just in one verse. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's something that we can miss because, yeah. uh, I mean, obviously culturally we're not in the same place. Yeah. We wear shoes. Like it's just a different thing. But as, as John the Baptist is speaking this yeah. and as Luke is recording this, like there's a significance there that is, hey, you know how the least... Like the servant, the this person, yeah. like I, from my studies, I remember hearing same kind of idea that Jews could not ask other Jews. This yeah. was beneath yeah. them that you could not do it. The least of servants would be the ones yeah. that would have to wash feet, like the yeah. least of the least. And John's going, I'm not even worthy to touch his feet. Like I'm not yeah. even worthy to clean. Like so the yeah. least of the least, you could not get any lower. He's going, Jesus is far above me. And I think that that, that culturally is something that could be lost in just a quick sentence when we don't understand it. So I, I appreciated kind of the taking time to read through that. Yeah, and the worst part is that's the, the, the least significant part of this passage, yeah, right? right? And so that's one of the dilemmas of teaching this way, which I love. I'm, my preference is open up the scriptures, let's grab a couple of verses and talk yeah. about them all. But it, it does kind of, uh, I don't know, stand in the way of, you know, linear teaching sometimes because right, right. I don't want you to get caught up on those little details, writing down those details because they're interesting, like the yeah. word asbestos later. Like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, right. But it's like, God, oh, no, I want, want to make sure that what you're seeing here, just a simple piece, is that John recognizes the contrast between Jesus and himself, yeah, right? right? And so that you see over and over again. God actually teaches this way between contrast, light, and darkness. So right. you've got the one that Jesus calls the greatest, and now you have Jesus on the scene. And the one that Jesus calls the greatest in this world is so, yeah. you know, unqualified to do yeah. the worst thing in this man's life, right? right? So it's like, wow, there's a big start, yeah. a start right. contrast there. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you said around that time that I, I feel like I found encouraging, but I wanted to dive a little bit deeper yeah. into, was you said, if something can withstand the fire, then it must be purged through the fire. And really, what does that mean? And maybe diving into a little bit more of that like uh, i know that just from conversation there was at least one other person that was like encouraged by that because i think we all go through seasons and situations where we feel like we're being purged or mm -hmm. we're you know god is purifying us and it doesn't feel great yeah but there's encouragement yes yeah, so that's really important and that's why i like this idea of where and that's it. my guess is if you've read this passage heard this passage typically when it says and he'll baptize you with holy spirit and fire yeah. we always go to the equipping moment in acts 2 right right, right. god let or in acts, acts 2 and 3 god lays down the, the power of the holy spirit right and right. so we immediately go to and we think about the holy spirit as its role in giving us this power right yeah. so when when it says that uh that he was baptized that's a that's a cleansing ritual. When they would have heard that for the first time, they're not thinking about the this, you know, impersonal power, which I would argue is a powerful person in the Holy Spirit, right? They're not thinking about how that's going to breathe life into things again, bring dead people back to life, lame right. people walk, blind people see, right? They're thinking more about baptism as in, I am so dirty, yeah. I just need to take a bath. Have you ever been there, like, that idea that you just feel so icky? Maybe even from a conversation, you just go, I just, gotta, just feel so dirty. When they're coming to this place of baptism, they're coming from that, angle yeah. so this literally is a bath right so they're coming in and so when we're looking at this what we're thinking about here more is the cleansing yeah and so if i had more time which i don't and that's what i'm thankful for this i'd go there's two roles that the holy spirit plays there's the empowering but before there's the empowering there's the purging yeah right so there is this there's this twofold process and what's really neat here is when you look at you know jewish uh, r laws and expectations before you use something, it has to be clean, right? You right. do that with your forks and your utensils. So there is a moment when you're going to use something where it's going to be empowered to do what it was created in this wor world to do, right? But before that happens, you have to prepare that thing. And so the Holy Spirit, this fire, you got two different ways. You're going to see kind of the bookends. Right here, you're going to see the first role of the Holy Spirit and the fire. Second end, in Acts chapter 2, you're going to see the second end, which is yeah. the empowerment of, of the, God's power in his people and the ability to communicate and understand and see, right? So you see the, the holy wind, the holy breath, and then you also see the flames of tongues, right? Yeah. So right. this would mimic that. Luke is the one writing about both of them. So at first glance, what usually happens is this means that Jesus was finally empowered, Right? Yep, that's true. He's, he's doing that. And the reason he was ready to do that is because he was already clean, yeah. right? But there is this 
purging and cleansing process that does happen in our lives. Right, and right. so we don't talk about that one much because right. it makes us feel so uncomfortable. So um, I mean, they would have understood this. In fact, what's so interesting about this term is like uh, wealthy Persians at the day, like they would have had um, these really uh, uh, fancy cloths that they could actually toss into fire. It would clean all the stuff off and they could pull it out. Like really? it was unquenchable, right? Okay. So, so okay. same kind of fibers as asbestos. And so they would have understood this as a purification statement, particularly when you see it next with the the winnowing fork. Okay, we, we get rid of all the excess, all the junk yeah, doesn't matter. Right. We let it burn off into the atmosphere and now we have what's remained. So when you think about all that stuff, what we now understand is what John is saying is there is going to be a, a day that Jesus will come and establish and rule and reign, and he's going to do it in his people, those that are tethered and attached to him. But one of the processes that are processes that will happen in that moment is he's going to prepare his people for what he has prepared for them. And you go, well, how does he, what, how does he do that? Aha, well, this is it. This is the purification yeah. piece. And so when it says fire and wind, that isn't, oh, he's going to give us some power. It's going, no, he's going to. He's going to make us everything he wants us to be and prepare us for that moment. Yeah. That's why he tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, hey, uh, or 6 through 8, like, stay here. Like, and then I'll, you'll receive my power, and then you'll be my witnesses in Samaria, Judea, uh, uh, Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, all those places, outermost parts of the earth. So we see that, and it goes, okay, well, he's actually talking about purification. Yeah. Which then leads me to that really crazy thing. Uh, and so I, I told you on Sunday, sorry about this, that, uh, that, that it's found in Leviticus. There is a lot of cleansing and purification purification laws in the book of Leviticus, right. right? But there's a narrative of these things when there's actually getting instruction from Moses to the people mm -hmm. when they actually apply it. And so it's actually found in Numbers where this verse is. Numbers uh, 31 verse 23, it says this. And anything that can withstand fire must be put through the fire, and then it will be clean. But it must also be purified with the water of cleansing. And whatever cannot withstand fire must be put through that water. So they're understanding this cleansing process that happens with baptism. And what's so striking to me is this word. Anything that can withstand fire must yeah. be put through it. Right? In other words, if something can withstand fire, the only way by which it is purified is by going through fire. Right? And so what you see here is Jesus is separating his people and he's, he's making them holy, called out separate from the people of this world. Yeah. And it sure seems like the way that he does that, winnowing fork. Yeah. And he is, he's, he's doing all those things. And so some people would use the argument that life is so hard, that must mean that God's not good, or that's not, that he's not worth trusting. So, no, 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 if, if this is where it is and you keep doing the next right thing, the reality is God is, I promise you, he is purifying you and preparing you for what he has prepared for you. So if you can withstand yeah. fire, well, then it makes sense that you'd walk through that. Because yeah. what the last thing God wants you to do is believe that you can do it on your own merits and your own way. Yeah. So what that means, and if you've been following Jesus for a while, you would attest to this. I can definitely do it. As long as I continue to rely on self-reliance, yeah. I am never going to get, I'm never going to be able to get where God wants me to be. Same with John the Baptist. So what has to happen is we have to be brought to a place where we're on complete and utter mm. dependence on him. When you find yourself in that spot in your marriage, in your addiction struggles, whatever it is, when you find yourself in that spot, then you are primed yeah. for this moment where you're going to see God's power and God's glory, right? Because first he purges, then he empowers. And mm -hmm. trying to so if you're experiencing that, not because you're, you know, a fool and have done dumb things and go, well, I keep having this problem, you know, well, do you keep, is this your behavior that's got to adjust? Or is it really that you continue to seek after God, but this just seems like a hard season and go just hold tight, find yeah. some community, because anything that can be put through the fire in order to be purified, must. must. Yeah. So I think that's really, really important to don't use your experiences and your circumstances to discount what God's doing, because before an empowering, there's a purging, yeah. and so that's just what happens in our life. And yeah. that's encouraging, but it's it goes against what we wa want yeah. and yeah. long for. Like, we look for comfort, right? right? Like, we, we can be complacent people. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. what we desire is comfort, security, but that's the opposite. Like if we're actually in the fire, if we're feeling and experiencing difficulty, that means that God is still moving and working within our lives. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. So is that a, a kind of a, a, a test? Like if I look at my life and it's all comfort and it's all rainbows and puppies, like it's bad versus if I look and see that there's difficulties and challenges that God is using. So that? I guess the question would be, well, whose work is it? <clears throat> okay. Right. And so Satan would love for you to enjoy the comfort of this yeah. world and, live comfortably have good things yeah 
and believe that you're the one who did all that stuff. Yeah. Right. So who gets the credit, I guess, is the question. Okay. Um, so if there's an experience in your life, you go, this is, I'm feeling the joy and peace. And the reality is what we have to offer our world is peace in the middle of struggles. Yeah. So I guess I can ask you, I can ask any of you, think about the times when you felt the closest to God. Yeah. Now think about the circumstances around those times. Yeah. <laughs> like for all of us, right? Like when you felt, if you felt close to God, right? When did you feel the closest? Yeah. In those times, like this is so crazy. The whole idea of Christianity is that we get to be with God forever. So why wouldn't God use whatever means necessary to draw us close to him so that we can depend on him and be empowered by him and find him as our source of strength and joy and peace, right? And so the whole point of Christianity is that you can be with God forever and enjoy that. That's what he created for us. And so I go, when when have you felt the closest? When have you called on his name the most? When have you sought him the most? And what's crazy is that almost always yeah. tends to be Difficult moments of seasons. fire and yeah. purification. So what that does, it does us two things. One, it allows us to draw close to him, and then it allows us to appreciate all the good. Like our small group was talking about a couple of weeks ago, kind of that hard thing of looking at our world and knowing that a lot of people don't have much, and we have so much here. And yeah. they're like, does that mean we should feel guilty about it? No, we should, we should share. We should be generous. But also, if those people were in our place, they would be so grateful for this meal. Like I struggle with this with, you know, like, uh, Christian on our staff just lost his dad. Jeanette on our staff just lost her dad. And, right? And you know, we have an elder in our church whose daughter is on our staff and is you know wrestling through cancer. And I go, man, they're, all that's so painful. And they don't have their parent or they can't lean on their parent or whatever that is. And I'm going, how, what? I feel so guilty to do that. But on the flip side of that, it goes, but if they were in my shoes, right. boy, would they lean into that, right? And so this purification process does two things. One, it makes us ready for what God has for us. And it gives us a view of what it's like to walk in God's glory and mm-hmm. God's goodness when those moments happen, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a both and, not an either or. Yep, yeah. God's in the good. God's in the bad. Can't give God credit for the good if he had, we can't give him credit for what he did during the bad. Right? Yeah. Not right. that he causes the bad. But boy, is he not wasting it. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's like two verses. Yeah. Um, so we continued, uh, like you talked about the winnowing fork, which just separates kind of the, the junk from the Chaff good, from the, good yeah, wheat. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but then if you could, and, and maybe I just didn't quite hear this, but like, uh, I want to hear more like what you were saying about the asbestos. Oh, yeah, asbestos yeah. is, I yeah. believe the word that they use there. Um, and the unquenchable fire. Could you just explain that? Maybe I just didn't hear it. So well. you were homeschooled. Yeah. So your school never got shut down because they had to come do an asbestos no. cleaning, right? Never. Even the um, never. the airport hangar that we just I, bought. I wasn't sure if you're yeah. like, you didn't understand yeah. that because you're yeah. homeschooled. Yeah, I'm like, wait, no, no, no. is that what he's saying? No. Like, wow. So <laughs> most of the schools built in the 60s, 70s. Okay. Uh, and the late and the nineties, they realized that the, that stuff in right. there was really bad. And what's so right. crazy is like, by the way, my, my grandfather died of emphysema. Okay, and was an air conditioning guy who put in mm-hmm. air conditioning vents in the sixties in Florida in those kind of okay. places. Wow. So uh, it took him a while to catch up to this, but there's some real stuff, bad stuff that asbestos does when it gets in your lungs. It can't get out, and it actually builds some growth cancer in okay. your body. And so that word asbestos is literally the Greek word asbestos. And it means just this fibrous thing, like an insulation or whatever, that is that it, it's built in such a way that it's melting point. I could not find that word on Sunday, but it's melting okay. point was a lot higher. Okay. Right? And so kind of the definition of asbestos is unquenchable, like okay. not able to fi- uh, burn. And so God is basically, what, what John is saying here is, hey, you might think that about yourself. You might think that the God of the universe can't, you know, that he's not powerful enough or he's not capable enough or you don't have, you can live your whole life and pretend like he doesn't exist and it will never burn you. Hmm. And regardless of your, of your melting point, regardless of your competence and competency and in Philippians, it tells us this, that it will come a day where every single knee will bow. Yeah. Some on the earth, some above the earth, some under the earth and every tongue will confess, including the Herodotians, <laughs> right? And that they will declare that Jesus is Lord. And this is the complicated part is when we say this, this is probably going, gosh, that's so arrogant, so mean. No, it's not mean. God's going, look, I want you on the team. Boy, you can right. attach yourself right. to me. But if you are going to be in opposition, what happens in the opposition is you hurt the people in my kingdom. Yeah. So there is justice that will happen one day. So when it talks about that unquenchable fire, it's talking about a God who, who will and can establish everything that is necessary to rule and reign and discard everything that yeah. stands in the way of that. So at some point, there is this... This purging and the separation. And the reason I want you to hear this is not because I want you to be scared, but I do want you to deal with the reality and the significance of if there's a God and it's his rules and it's his kingdom, yeah. when we walk in defiance to that, 
and your political ideology or whatever you put your hope in, there will be a day that you will have this awareness come and there'll be a very rude awakening and Jesus here, John's going, hey, look, this is the time to not tether yourself to me, but to tether yourself for Jesus because that is the only way, the only way by which you can be made right and perfect and holy for the God of the universe. The idea of Christianity is uh, in Adam, that's the first person, we are messed up, can't fix anything. But just as one person got us into this, right? One person can get us out of it. And not just get us out of us out of it. That's what mercy is, get us out of something. But it also gets us in. That's actually what it says in Romans. That's grace to all that God had planned. And so the reality is it isn't hard work on our part. It just is a submission of the will to go, God, I want to be on your team and I want to submit myself to you. Not because you're afraid of the fire, but because you long for something. And you know that, I know that, everyone knows that. We long for something that we just haven't been able to attain yet. And so what we get here is going, everything else. Everything else is just going to be burned up in the fire, meaning uh, it's just pointless. Yeah. Like everything that you put your hope in, any trinket will one day end up in the landfill, yeah. right? So everything else is going to lead you astray, and it's just going to be burnt in the fire. Yeah. So why not attach yourself, tether yourself to the one that yeah. can withstand that? Yeah. So uh, as we kind of yeah. move forward, I think the next point that I had um, and there's, uh, again, this is version oh, yeah. version two, so I would encourage you to please. Maybe we should add like a, a second over time on Thursday. Like 3.0 yeah. or something? I don't know. So but content. there's so yeah. much more that we could get into. Yeah. So, But the next thing that I did want to talk about was, was uh, what would you call it? The her uh, Herodotians. Her Herodotians. Keeping up with the Herodotians. Yeah. So like, Herodotians. Herodotians. Like, yeah. So let's that's talk so about cool. that because he makes this kind of entry into it with um, – Verse 19, but Herod the uh, Tetrarch. How yeah. did, how did Tetrarch. Tetrarch. That means just the governor of a fourth of the empire. Yeah. yeah. So he makes kind of, so Luke kind of pulls him into the story because yeah. John had reproved him or told him that what he did was wrong. Yeah. And then you, I had never heard the details of that, even though it lists yeah. right here. Yeah. And I loved your illustration. Like I loved your visual, like the broken heart. No, that's that was nice. really helpful You're You're just welcome. because I could then understand that Herod stole his brother's wife, who's also his <laughs> niece. And it just leaves you scratching your head going, I know that this guy was all powerful. Like he was the king or the ruler, like he had authority, but what, why in the world would he? Yeah. Like I just, uh, can you, I don't know, speak more to that. That was. Yeah. So how far to the rabbit trail do you go? Right. Like, I don't I mean, know. Like Maybe it, not yeah, too far. Yeah. Cause that's weird stuff. So yeah. And I think that's the thing <laughs> is that, that inevitably, and this is why to be honest with you, we struggle with sexuality, particularly about the inequality that some people say in marriage. And one of the, the first responses to the political right and you know, the fundamental Christian is, Gay people are gay because they're dirty, right? Yeah. And so the more you investigate, and, and the reason for that is because that you see stuff that's, and please, if you just heard that, stay with me. I'm going yeah. to help you understand Hang it. There. Um, because there's just this dec uh, declaration that's perverse. And the reason uh, that people think that is because there's a lot of people who have, and you see this with pedophilia, and you see this with bestiality. I mean, all those kind of things, awkward words. Sorry if your kids are in the car. Really, I'm sorry for that. But you see kind of this turning over the leaf, turning over the leaf, turning over the leaf, this search for this pleasure. And you know this mm -hmm. with the drug. Sex is the same thing. When you get the same feel over and over again, it doesn't have the same release of the same mm -hmm. endorphins, right? And so every drug, everything, you have to move one step deeper, one yeah. step further down. And so what was really easy in the 70s was homosexuality is just that perverse. It was a, a guy who had a, you know, a, a wife, then he had an affair, then he got hooked on pornography, and then he started chasing for things. And the next thing you know, he found someone else who liked the same thing. That, you know, you had homosexuals who were doing it for the climax of it, right? You know, it, it's much more complicated than that in our broken world and how people view that and lots to work on in sexuality and I'm happy to, to, to dabble and talk about that in a different context than this, right? But so kind of the the belief is for for a long time was just on perversion, and and we do see that we do see as people chase after more perversions. That's why even why some of this transgender stuff is really really complicated because in some ways you go there's something wrong in the head that we got to work on when someone sees one thing and feels another right all mm -hmm. sorts of complications and all of us got our brokenness and our complications so we should have empathy towards it but the belief for the longest time was again this is about a man who wants to dress up because of just some perversion right and so you got you got DNA and sociological and psychological issues that lead someone down a path and that, that could uh, do some real damage that we have to care for it, empathize and also go there is a, a construct gender male female marriage male female that God originally did so that's one side but the side that we do really understand have spent a lot of time on in the Christian world is the perversion side the, yeah. the idea that you keep chasing the next thing the next thing yeah. the next thing so 
you got all that, and you go, okay, now you got these really rich Her- Herodosians, yeah. and they can have everything that's available to them. Everything, right? And it was okay for them. Children, but okay, nothing in the scriptures about Animals, nothing in the scriptures for them. The only thing that wasn't okay was the relatives. So yeah. you got all these people that have all the things. What do they want? The things that they can have, right? Yeah. Because the things that they have obviously hasn't supplied and cared for them and given them the fulfillment they're looking for. Yeah. So they just keep chasing down the things, and now all of a sudden you got a guy who's married to his niece, and this person goes, I don't I didn't get to marry my niece, yeah. right? And so now he's going to steal that person there because there's just this pattern of brokenness that we yeah. want the things that we're told that we can't have, yeah. right? There's just something in us that is l- literally the beginning of all sin was mm. someone here and they couldn't have what they wanted. Yeah. I didn't even know they wanted it probably until they heard they couldn't have it. And then all of a sudden <laughs> there's just like this attachment to it. So you got that going on. Then you have a guy, and this is where it gets complicated that I don't, I won't solve for you today. And not sure I'll solve it in the next couple of weeks. There is a time to speak truth to power. Yeah. Right? Because John the Baptist actually calls this out. Yeah. So you go, well, at what point do we call out Joe Biden's moral failures? At what point do we call out Trump's moral failures? At what point do we say that? And we go, well, what, what's the point in saying that? Where yeah. is that? Where's the benefit? So for John the Baptist in that moment, it's probably him going to his followers. You cannot chase those things. Yeah. It will lead to more brokenness. Look at how broken their families. He literally murdered his brother. You see this. Look at yeah. Herod the Great. He literally murdered several of his wives. So can you see the brokenness of it? So John the Baptist is taking physical evidence of what's going on around them and going, do you not see that this doesn't work? Yeah, right. And so he's calling out all that stuff. And so we just get this picture. And why this is really important is what you're going to see now is you're going to see this wedge start to be put in between the kingdoms of this earth. Yeah. That's government kingdoms and political kingdoms and religious kingdoms. So this is the first moment you see that. Now, what's going to eventually get Jesus murdered is he's going to fight against and declare that he is the king. And the king of the religion, the king of the politics, has no authority over him, right? And so this is a very important moment because this is where you see kind of the foreshadowing of everything that's come. This is the moment where there is a political kingdom and when the gospel started to invade that and started calling people to the only place that can give them fulfillment, right? Yeah. The Her- Herodotians or Herodians, the Herod folks cannot fulfill you. Your yeah. political leanings cannot fulfill you. And guess what? They also can't forgive you, yeah. right? And so they can't forgive you of your sins. They have no authority. So the one who can fulfill you is also the one who can forgive you. And so when you see in this moment, John the Baptist called out and you go, yep, here's what's at war. Yeah. These people, their comfort, their pleasure, their... Um, their sovereignty that they believe they have, the ability to do whatever they want to, and their power, their control, you know, and all those things, and their comfort and their security, they are going to fight hard against the kingdom, which is so countercultural yeah. to that. So this is the moment that that happens. So then we can see it kind of play out. Okay, here's yeah. what's happening. It gets worse. Salome, the baby, uh, the yeah. little uh, right. uh, stepdaughter of uh, Herodicia, or yeah. Um, she, yeah. Herodias, sorry. Uh, the stepdaughter is the one who's going to ask for John the Baptist's head. Yeah, so that's right. where you see all this happen. So it's going, right. what you see here is just a pattern of people like you and I. We just we all have our different things, right? So you think it's the next video game system. You think it's the next, uh, you know, meal. You think it's the next, you know, uh, high. Whatever that is, is going to be the thing that's finally going to be the thing. And eventually you go down that rabbit trail long enough and the cumul- cumulative effect of that, it leads you into a place of uh, complete and utter captivity. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's where we find Herod. I, and his, I feel like you like there was two other things that yeah. I was like you talked about this uh, this tension. But you know, on Sunday you had said the tug of war between the earthly kingdom that's right. and here it Jesus' is. kingdom, and here's that. Like so, I feel like that just perfectly set up where I was trying to get to and lead to of of what your your message. So was that's the about. that's the whole idea of the series, and it's actually yeah. this verse that goes, "Oh, I think we can do that here," because people are going to start trying to put their hope in something that can't fulfill right. them or forgive them. Right. And so here we see what what Luke is doing is he's helping us see the the right kingdom, the kingdom you and I long for, the one, as it says in the Old Testament, that's filled with shalom and peace, which is the opposite of what we have now, which is the sickness, right? That is about to be established, and Jesus is about to enter into it at the age of 30. Really interesting here about the age of 30. Some stuff we'll talk about next week in terms of the genealogy of Mm. kind of established at a certain time with certain people. And so there is a role we play in the kingdom. We'll see it next week, Mm. uh, this upcoming week. But in this moment, we see kind of the, okay, here it is. This is what's about to happen. He's about to establish his kingdom. And he's about to invite everybody into it. And those who decide to walk in defiance are going to feel the judgment and the wrath of trying to fight against the coming kingdom of God. Yeah, that's good. 
Uh, so as we get to 20 and 21, yeah. or, or 21 and 22, this is where Jesus is actually bapti- baptized. <laughs> yeah. You pulled out something. One, of, one you said Jesus um, foreshadows what he would ultimately do on the cross. And that's the whole symbolism of baptism. What we still believe and we yeah. still do today of going down. Old life Death, is gone. Burial. Dead, resurrection. Raising to new life with Jesus. So that was yeah. a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do on the cross. Yeah. But then also you, you talk about prayer prayer being prescriptive yeah. um, because Jesus was praying at, at verse 21 it says um, and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying I did it again here yeah and every time Luke talks about prayer you said um, something crazy and, and supernatural happened like so I didn't know if there was anything more that you wanted to talk about there and then the last thing I want to get to is is in verse 22 where G, where God says this is my son in whom I'm well pleased like I think that that's beautiful and even the point that you made on Sunday of going, Jesus hadn't done anything yet. Yeah. It wasn't because he had done so many things, he performed well. Jesus hadn't done any ministry yet. This was kind of the inauguration of him into ministry, if you will. Like from here, he goes into the desert and yeah. he, then he performs miracles. But uh, anything more as we're, I guess yeah. we're getting close on time. But so anything, I did it again. Sorry about that. Uh, this is the piece that I go, oh, I really want to talk about. Um, so all of us... Uh, it, we all we all want to follow someone, and we all would like to be followed, yeah. right? But we all deep down know we're probably there's parts of us that aren't worth following, yeah. right? But there's this longing for that, and there's people we want to follow, but we wonder if they'll get us where we want to go, right? Mm-hmm. And so what's happening now is Jesus is going, "I am the one worth following. I'm mm-hmm. the one," and all that stuff. So you're about to see that, and God's about to establish that, and we know He's going to establish it because this is the moment He affirms it. Yeah. So almost every time when Jesus is praying, right after that, something really, really significant happens. You got to see this. This is the God of the universe. Yeah. And he decided to step on this planet, live a humble life, serve people, make some real crazy declarations. And here, here, you see it other times, that Jesus is praying before anything supernatural happens. Like, this is the guy who can make dead people live, yeah. blind people see, lame people walk. And so there's something significant about this that I can't explain. I can't explain it. I don't even, this is why I get so confusing to me it's it's sacred it's a sacrament that something supernatural happens when we pray because we see jesus it's evident so remember luke has read the other you know um manuscripts the biographical sketches of jesus life he's read matthew mark probably pretty familiar with john would have talked to john a lot and so this is the only one that captures this part of this moment Mm. so what we know is that the heavens are about to open up and it is important for luke to help Theophilus know there is a role by which there is something that Jesus did in this moment that yeah. allowed that to happen. There's mm-hmm. baptism. Now, that is a picture of what's to come. So it's not the baptism that is enacting this. Yeah. It's not the baptism. That's a moment, and you go, oh, that's really cool. But that's not the mo- That's not the thing. Like yeah. It didn't save him. It didn't fix him. So it was Jesus speaking to his heavenly father yeah. and his heavenly father responding. Yeah. So there's something about this where I go, guys, 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 as we work through this series together, there's going to be a lot that you're going to want to fix and you're going to feel really helpless to fix. I agree with you wholeheartedly. But there is something we can do mm-hmm. and see some supernatural event as the result, and that mm-hmm. is prayer. And so I think when you see this, it's just so important to go, yes, Jesus is praying. Like the God of the universe decides to pray. He doesn't have to pray. He's God. But he's there's something that Luke wants us to understand. There's something that Jesus is modeling here to go. You want to see the heavens open up. What you do and I do. If you don't believe in Jesus, you want to see the heavens open up. You would like to see and experience all that you long for, right? Yeah. And it just feels like it's in some distant, out there future. And you're wondering if it's even possible, if you're ever going to be satisfied. You literally write this second. All of us are just wondering if there's something wrong with us. Yep, there is something wrong. We're sick. And there's something we long for that we cannot achieve or do mm. on our own. And so the way by which we gain access to that. According to the scriptures, it says Jesus had been baptized. So, And when Jesus had been baptized, that's past tense. So yeah. He gets baptized. That's just happened. And was praying. I don't know if he's praying aloud or anything. And was praying. So you see this. It says when Jesus had been baptized. Past tense. That's already happened. Yeah. And was praying. That's present tense. The heavens opened. Yeah. The heavens were open. So it was something about that moment, that detonation button that opened mm. up the heavens and I'm going 31 days can we just do that together yeah. even if you don't believe in this stuff would you just just for a month of your life you've been you know 31 days to slow the spread you got this right <laughs> 31 days to pray you can do this right? you can do this and who knows maybe it comes 300 days of prayer yeah. whatever that is but you can do this you've learned that you are more long suffering than you thought you were yeah. 
So could you just every day for a moment just ask God to have his way? And we've actually given you the passages and some words to use. Yeah. You can click on the top of the clcfamily.church page. You can look probably if you're on social media right now on Facebook, just scroll up to the last post. Yeah. Every single day we'll post it there. Would you do that with us so we could see the heavens yeah. open up? And so then what it says here is really, really important. And what we get to see here, remember, I just told you at the very beginning of this, Jesus is perfectly clean. We are perfectly dirty. Yeah. We are as dirty as they come, and Jesus is perfectly clean as he can be. And you go, well, how in the world do you get to be seen by God as perfectly clean? Well, remember, John the Baptist described himself as absolutely filthy in comparison to Jesus' as a sandal, meaning Jesus' sandal, that which is on Jesus' feet, is infinitely more clean than John the Baptist mm-hmm. is. So the way by which you find cleansing and righteousness is by attaching yourself to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so what God is showing us here in this moment is that he sees his son as perfect and righteous. Yeah. He sees him. Because he's a son. The same way I feel about my son. The same way I feel about my girls, right? There's nothing they could do to make me love them any less. I promise you there's nothing. There are things they could do to frustrate me. But that love is, um, and I'm a flawed human, but it is it is unconditional. Mm-hmm. So we see this in this moment. Jesus has not done anything yet. Not d- done a single miracle. And we hear God's affirmation of him, which is, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And when we invite Jesus to cover us, that's how God sees you as well. So if you're a Christian... Like if you've asked Jesus, if you've received his life as a ransom for your life, if you've asked him to come and cover you, then right this second, those heavens still want to open up and God wants to make that same declaration over you. You're his child with whom he's well pleased. How do you get there? By talking to him. So pause and talk. Just keep doing that and see what God does over the next month as we ask him to do something crazy in our world and definitely in our country and in our community. Yeah, uh, again, you can find that 31 Days of Prayer, kind of it's a PDF thing that if you're interested, again, on our social media, we're posting that every single day, but you can also find kind of all 31 days at clcfamily.church at the very top of the website. So pretty much any of the pages that you go to online will have that there. And and yeah, I thought that that was just a beautiful, uh, you said that Jesus esteems and gives value before we do anything. Like, and it just reminded me again of, of Ephesians 2, verses 10, where it says, By grace we're saved through faith, not of ourselves, um, not by works. And then verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork or his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That works only comes after the the faith and the believing. Like it's not works and then therefore I'm, I'm yeah. good and I'm made right. It's only after that we actually get to do the works that he has in store for us, not from a place of we need to, we have to, but because of who we are in Christ and we understand that. So, so let me take these last two minutes here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share something with you that's brand new in my life, heart, soul, that I think God's given me, like really, like yesterday even. And it will make its way in the sermon series. But since you've literally leaned in this long, I'll give it to you first. And so one of the things I personally wrestle with is the, you know, John uh, 15, remain in me, I also in you. And yeah. uh, apart from you, you can do nothing. Like this right. idea that we're supposed to just abide and rest. And be honest with you, I have a hard time teaching it to you. And I have a hard time doing it because I'm so afraid of being lazy, right? And so you got all those things. And so I'm going, God, what does it mean to remain? Like, what does it mean? And I think the word it's given me is reside. Lots of R's here. Reside. Like, it means to set up residence in this place with Jesus. And so I feel like the Lord's teaching me, and I'm going to teach it as well and work through it. And this will really help us decide who to vote for on this kind of thing. Because remaining kind of has these three parts. First one is resting, right? Just resting, knowing the God of the universe loves you. So resting. And then it's receiving, right? So rest. Just rest. Like, take a deep breath this is my son with whom i'm well pleased he's pleased with you yeah. receive that and hear from him maybe it's through the scriptures maybe it's through praying right rest receive and then respond yeah. there's going to be a response so even as you prepare to vote would you just rest in him knowing he is the lord and he is king and he's going to respond to our prayers rest and just receive that peace that comes from him and then get the clarity that wants you to do and then respond and then you'll have these three questions to ask on when and how to respond and then you'll ask the question is it the right time hmm. Right? Is this is it the right time to respond in this? Is this the right way to respond? Mm-hmm. And finally, is it for the right reasons? Are you doing this because it's simply because you want to respond to God and be obedient? Somehow you think that you earned that. Mm-hmm. Like, if I do this, God will love me more. So you're going to rest over this. Receive it and respond. A lot to ours. Then is it the right uh, time to do it? Right? Uh, is it the right way to do it right now in our world? And is it for the right reasons? When you get a yes to all three of those, it is time to mm-hmm. respond and see what God can do in our life and receive that and see the heavens open up. So you're going to hear more about that over the next several weeks, but I want you to be aware of that as we prepare. 
So we're just a little bit over an hour. It looks like an hour and three minutes or so. Was there any final Not thoughts? That, that okay. was my final thoughts. Well, we want to say thank you guys for joining us. We really hope that this challenges and encourages your faith walk and that you get to go deeper. That's the whole point of why we started Overtime. And next week will be a year into it. So thanks for joining us, whether you're watching us live, whether you're listening to us, or you have just stumbled upon this podcast years after doing it. We hope that it's encouragement. So thanks, and we will see you next week. Okay, see ya. Stumble upon it in years. Yeah, sure. If that's you right now, that you stumble upon it in years, would you let us know so that Ben it, can say, it could see, happen. I told you so. It could happen.